Why does God allow polygamy in the Bible? Well, for the same reason he allows sin. Polygamy is like sitting down on a public restroom toilet without a barrier. It's not illegal, but it's also not wise. It doesn't do you any good. And that's the same with polygamy. As a matter of fact, it is true that while those that will say that there is no outward outlawing or prohibition against polygamy, the fact of the matter is there actually is. There is no one, even in the Bible, who can say that them taking extra wives, that they're doing so to glorify God. They are doing it to benefit themselves. There is no one that can say that they are promoting what God's intended use of marriage actually is. And all we got to do is just go back and look at Genesis chapter 2, 24. After Adam names woman, after she is taken out of his side and woman is formed, then what does he say? He says that uh, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Obviously, he's trying to convey the issue or the point that they are one, they are unified. And he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And this is singular and they shall become one flesh. You cannot do this if there are multiple wives and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This um, exclusive relationship, this bond is how God obviously intended it. As a matter of fact, so much so, what does Jesus say? He says when speaking to the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees came and said, why does or is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Why is this happening uh, for any reason at all? Are we able to do that? Jesus answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So what is he saying? He's Jesus is appealing back to creation, you know, the creation that he brought forth. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall be one flesh he made male and female why for them to be joined together and be one flesh so they are no longer two but are one flesh so what god has joined together therefore let no man separate let no one come between them remember this is god who has a problem with him joining with israel but what would israel do be adulterous and go after other gods well, do we think that this is what God wanted? Obviously not. He calls them that. He calls them adulterers for a reason. And we are to be the exact same way, um, chaste and only committed to him. And so if we go back through history, let's think about this. Let's think about what God is doing. God has determined that the man should have a woman. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew, as well as in the Greek, the term for wife is the exact same term for woman. The, the term for husband is the exact same term for man. Well, why is that? Because when you think about what a wife is, you think about it in the possessive. His wife, her husband, the wife to him, the, the husband to her. These are possessive. So it's not the word wife. It's his woman. It's not uh, the word husband. It's man. It's her man belong to them. So what makes a what makes a man a husband? The same thing that makes a woman a wife. It's belonging to them, his wife or his woman, her man. And so the very first time that we see this, think about this, the very first time that we see this, we see this godly line coming out of Seth, but we see this ungodly line coming out of Cain. And the first time that we see this, God is telling them to be fruitful, and multiply, to carry about the image of God, the glory of God throughout the world and to propagate that. But what does the ungodly line of Cain do? They do just the opposite. Rather than promoting God, they promote themselves. They build cities and they stay there rather than multiplying. They want to stay in one place and name cities and have after themselves and have monuments after themselves. And what do they do? Well, there are two men in the Bible by the name of Lamech. One is good, one is through the godly line of Seth, but one is through the ungodly line, the evil, wicked line of Cain. And so if we go to Genesis chapter 4, uh, verse, let's start in verse 17. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch, not the good Enoch, <laughs> this is the other Enoch, and built a city and called his the name of the city Enoch after his son, not trying to glorify God, but to glorify himself. Now, Enoch was born in Irad, and Irad became the father of Mehula, and Mehula, Mehuhael, became the father of uh, Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech. And look what it says. Notice why God makes his point. Lamech 
took to himself two wives. The name of one was Ada and the other was Zilha. So the first time that this happens does not happen in the godly line of Seth, but through the ungodly, wicked line of Lamech. Do we think that this was in keeping with what God was teaching? No, the first time that we see this is on that. As a matter of fact, we don't see anyone taking multiple wives through the godly line of Seth until something pretty influential, pretty important happens. And that is in Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, it says, now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them. Notice what he says, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. There are some that believe that we're talking about these, some sort of race between angels and human beings. That's not what he's speaking of. We know he's speaking about, about males, about men, about flesh, because he says they took themselves for themselves wives, whomever they, they chose. The Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man, not angels, with man forever, because he is also flesh. And so he says, nevertheless, the days uh, his day shall be 120 years. So he's speaking of men. He calls these people uh, Nephilim, the, the result of them, these giants. But we see these giants even later on. But I don't want to make a point about Nephilim. The point is about what he says here. And he says, and they took wives, plural, for themselves, whomever they chose. So they're taking these plural wives. Why? Well, this is in keeping with the ungodly line of Cain. This is not what God is looking for. Now, there were some that may have said they had legitimate reasons for having multiple wives. And again, God allows this not because he is approving of it, just like he allows sin, not because he's approving of it, but he is going to use this to bring about one, his rulership, and to obviously he's going to punish those people who are engaged in sin if they don't repent and follow him. But there were those who would do so because maybe man marries a woman and she doesn't have any children. And so to keep the the lineage going, he may take another wife, a concubine or a wife who can bear children. Well, again, we see this happening and we even see it happening to where it is beneficial. God will still take our sin or the things that we do that are not correct and still use it to benefit or bring about his glory. You think about someone like Samuel, whose mother, Hannah, uh, was married to a man who had two wives and his name was Elkanah and he had two wives. One was Hannah and the other one was Penina. And through this, the fact that she was barren, she prayed and God opened her womb because God had closed her womb and then God opened her womb. What if men would be faithful and trust that God would do what he wanted to do in terms of these women having, uh, having a child and waiting on God, just like someone like a Zechariah would do so who uh, is the father married to one woman, and though her womb was closed, they were still faithful to God, and then we see John the Baptist show up. And when you think about it, we've seen people who are used by God who also had multiple wives. You think about Abraham. You think about the problem that happened with Abraham and really the world because Abraham did not uh, initially trust God and decided to go and to have this child with Hagar. Well, what are the problems that have come about as a result of that? When you think about Jacob, though that there was a blessing that came about, there was also some problems that were fraught in this relationship with him and his wife, as well as his concubines. It's not what a good family uh, life is made of. What about all the ruin that comes to David's household? Because one, he's already got wives or got a wife. And then what does he do? Take another wife, another man's wife, who incidentally, one of the issues, one of the things we notice is that it's typically some man who has either great wealth or power, maybe a king, maybe a leader, someone with with money who will take multiple wives. But the average person, uh, irrespective of what society was in, did not have multiple wives, one, because it can be expensive. Um, and that two, he's not trying to uh, extend his reign or his reach. But what does David do? He takes one man's wife. He's only got one wife. He takes that wife for himself and kills that man. And then, of course, we know the result of that. You think about what happened with Solomon taking all of these wives and that ended him. That that you think about Solomon who take who took multiple wives, thousands of wives, and how what sort of effect was that on him as well as the nation of Israel. And now some will say that the Bible does not prohibit it. Some will say that God has not uh, outlawed or said that he does not want polygamy. The fact of the matter is he has said so. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, he says, he shall not speak about these kings or leaders. He shall not multiply wives for himself. 
Well, that should be pretty clear. But some will say, well, no, that just means he shouldn't have too many wives. No, it should be taken as he should not have multiple wives. What's multiple wives? More than one. Two or more are multiple wives wives. And then going to uh, what Jesus said again, Jesus brings us up in Matthew chapter 19. He says that for the two shall be joined together as one. Has God not said it should be this way? And so God is clear what he wants, but it's not just there where God makes this point. God brings this up in a couple other places. Paul brings us up in first Corinthians chapter seven. He says, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But notice what he says. But because of the immoralities, each man is to have his own gunaika. There's his own woman. And we translate this as wife. Remember I said that when you see this own or possessive or possession, that woman is now his wife and every woman should have her own man. And each woman, each gunaika is to have her own idion Andra, which is a male, her own man, her own husband. Notice the singularity or the singular use of these words. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, singular, and likewise also her to her husband. So what is Paul commanding? This should be one woman for one man, one man for one woman. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians, when speaking about how it ought to be done, how husbands ought to love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church so that he might sanctify her. Now he's using the singular, uh, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all glory, having no spot or wrinkle. So husbands ought to love their own wives. Now someone might come back and say that there's a plural use of the word wives here, but he's not speak. He's speaking kind of collectively, but we know he's speaking of one wife because he says your own wives, your own. And this is harkening back to what he says in first Corinthians. But just so we can make sure that he's speaking of one woman for the man. What does he invoke? He invokes what Christ says. Verse 30, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and should be joined to his wife. Singular. And the two not the three or the four shall become one flesh. And so does God allow polygamy? Sure, he does. Again, does he allow sin? Sure. How long will he allow that? Not long. What is his plan? What is what is his preference? What does he want us to do? Whether you be a leader or, and obviously the Bible tells us that a leader can only have one woman. And interestingly enough, at this time we see polygamy, though it's not outlawed, we see it decreasing. But still, for leaders, the leader cannot have more than one wife. And we see what Jesus is telling us to do is also what the Lord is also stating through someone like Paul. And so does God allow polygamy? Yes, that is true. Just like it's true that God also says that we should not have more than one wife as shown and demonstrated by the scriptures.